<clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Lawrence. I'm uh, director of the Center for a Liberal Future, and I am really uh, delighted to uh, have you all here to meet and hear from a very special friend and a hero of the sustainable uh, food movement, uh, not just in the United States, but increasingly around the world. Uh, Will Allen, a son of a sharecropper, an outstanding basketball player, went to the University of Miami, where he played for the Hurricanes, and where he will res None of that. <laughs> this is Tar Heel country. Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> And um, in fact, Will will be honored with an honorary degree by President Donna Shalala at the University of Miami this uh, commencement season. Uh, will went on to, he was drafted by the uh, Baltimore Bullets, but uh, chose to play with uh, the Miami Floridians of the then uh, newly created American Basketball Association. And then he played in the European Professional League a good bit of his time in Belgium where he acquired a taste for fine European cuisine. We haven't talked about Belgian beer, but I suppose that was part of it too. Um, and now Will, uh, for the last almost 20 years, has been running uh, Growing Power Incorporated in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Will is regarded uh, as among the preeminent thinkers of our time on agriculture and food policy. Uh, he has been uh, honored with a MacArthur Award. Along with uh, the First Lady, he uh, launched the White House Let's Move program in 2010. And later that year in 2010, Time Magazine recognized him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, not just in the U.S., but in the world. Uh, since then, uh, Will has received numerous awards and recognitions, including uh, the NEA Foundation's uh, Cor Corporation Award for Outstanding Service to Public Education, the James Beard Leadership Award uh, last year, and the Theodore Roosevelt Award by the National Collegian Athletic Association in 2012. In 1993, when Will Allen started Growing Power in Milwaukee, he combined a number of brilliant insights that he'll share with you in his presentation, so I'm not gonna spend any time on that, except that this has become a model uh, for restoring our uh, food security, especially in urban communities throughout the country. His center provides hands-on training, on-the-ground demonstrations, outreach, technical assistance, and will re be running its biannual uh, conference in September, expected to attract about 3,000 participants. I want to remind uh, everyone that today we are live streaming uh, this event, and the Twitter feed, uh, the Twitter hash is uh, up on the screen, Future of Food, uh, so we invite those of you who are watching us from your computer screen uh, to please uh, send us your comments and Will will be uh, dealing with them in the question and answer period. Will, we thank you again for being here and for all that you're doing for food security at home and abroad and for the fabulous example you set for all of us. Please join me in welcoming you.
When I graduated uh, high school, I had over 100 scholarship offers, and my goal was to uh, get an education and play professional basketball. And I said, I'll never go back to that farm. We're able to move from less than 1% of local food production to 10%. That was a billion dollar change. We're growing energy here. Uh, we're growing soil, uh, we're growing people, and we're growing a community because we're anchored here in a community that badly needs food. So part of that, this whole uh, concept is really about growing community as well as providing the most important thing to all of us, which is our food. family was in farming. My father was a sharecropper, but unlike many African-American males uh, at that time, he wanted myself and my brothers to know uh, where our food came from and for practical reasons uh, to be able to grow our own food. As we sit here today, we're losing rural farmland and we're losing farms. A million since 1960. Actually, I was driving down the street here uh, at the time, uh, back in 1993, I was working for Procter & Gamble in sales and sales technology, and uh, I just saw the for sale sign, and I stopped, and I wrote down the number. You know, I said to myself, this is the place that I, I could land, and that's when I got in trouble. <laughs> I knew a little bit about the area. Five blocks away is the largest housing project we have here in Milwaukee called West Lawn was uh, pretty much a, a what is called a food desert and the only access to food is corner stores and what they call fast food swamps. As a matter of fact, many of our kids are eating food that our grandmothers wouldn't recognize as food. I was just in Cleveland. I met with the mayor of Cleveland and uh, he really gets it. We're starting to get a lot of waste from uh, food wholesalers. They throw away thousands and thousands of pounds of food waste a week. I want the same food to go to all, uh, all people in all communities. And to do that, you have to figure out ways of reducing uh, the production costs. And part of that is what we do here in terms of growing soil uh, by using renewable energy to keep the cost in line so we can get that food to everybody at a reasonable cost. People come here, they want to know, how did you do that here? You know, how would, did you make that happen on these three acres? How can we do that? This farm system is a unique farm system. It's part of, uh, I think, ag of the future in terms of how we grow food here very intensively uh, using uh, every square foot and everything that we discover, we pass on to uh, folks that come here. It's not like we want to stick it in some closet and try to make money off of it. Everything we discover, we pass on to other folks. I don't think I've ever interviewed anyone who was officially named a genius by a major foundation. How did you find out that you were getting the MacArthur Genius Award? In our city, we have a lot of vacant land. In the Midwest, there's hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of acres inside cities. Cities like Detroit, cities like uh, Youngstown, Ohio, and Buffalo, New York, uh, Chicago where they have 77,000 vacant lots, some 33 square miles of vacant land, that we can grow food. I always believed in uh, having a diverse group of folks to work with, so diversity is at the top of my agenda. One of the declarations I made with the city was that I would hire kids from the community. Then we started being looked at uh, as an asset to the community because we were providing jobs. I live 10 blocks up from here, and I used to walk past here every day when I was in high school to go to the basketball court. And one day I just stopped in. Love it here. I would have never thought that I would be doing something like this. But I love it. Whoever wants help, whether they're from Detroit or some small rural community in Alabama or Mississippi or upstate in Wisconsin, we engage those communities. So it's not just inner city, it's not just urban, it's rural communities that are hurting uh, today as well. But it's really all about food. 
and how we uh, are going to try to change the existing food system to make it uh, something that really works for everybody. People think because they spend a lot of money for food that food is uh, fresh and good. But we know when food travels many miles, it loses a lot of its nutrient uh, value. And the system that we need is to go back to those days where our food system was local. A sustainable food system is the only way to really end hunger in the world. Uh, the industrial food system, it hasn't worked. We have to change our food policy, our national food policy. And to do that, we need concrete projects like this and others around the country to change policy. We just can't compete with going to D.C. and standing in line and trying to lobby for something. We have to prove that this works. We have to prove that this cash flows. It's something that we uh, need to continue to, to grow. There are some challenges that we have to overcome uh, to make it grow. Being a former athlete, you know, I like competition and I like challenges. I've always wanted to guard the best player take the last shot in the game or whatever you know I, I like that kind of challenge and, and if you can transfer that over into something like this it becomes a very powerful and uh, good thing for the community Good morning. A actually, it's afternoon, but uh, since I'm from Wisconsin, uh, you know, uh, I'll say good morning. Um, I want to thank the center uh, for inviting me here. Uh, this has really been uh, uh, a delight for me to get to know some folks. Uh, one in particular who, uh, uh, whenever I travel, I uh, recently had in 2010 a knee replacement, and then I had a hip replacement about 12 weeks ago. So I always need somebody that. Uh, kind of takes care of me uh, on my trips. And uh, I had uh, uh, Mia. Mia, will you stand up? Uh, she works for the, you guys probably know Mia. She's like uh, half my size, but very powerful young lady. You know? <laughs> but uh, it's really uh, great to be back uh, in my home state. I actually grew up uh, uh, on the border of Rockville and Bethesda. Um, uh, not too far from here, and it's always great. I always wanted to do uh, work in uh, D.C., Baltimore, Metropolitan, in Maryland for many, many years. And um, it took a couple years ago before I actually had an opportunity to do that. Now uh, I'm doing quite a bit of work in the, in, uh, the state of Maryland, uh, working with UDC, and now coming here. Uh, so it, uh, this is, like, really special for me quite frankly. Uh, but I really wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the food system. I could talk all day and I don't want to do that because uh, I have this PowerPoint uh, that I wanted to show you. And uh, a couple of people have already seen it and uh, it actually has about close to a thousand images. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a PowerPoint with a thousand images. Uh, but I can do it in uh, you know, maybe 45 minutes or 45 hours, whatever you guys want. Uh, <laughs> You know, of course, they'll have to bring in food and cots and all that stuff, but we do the 45-hour uh, thing. But uh, I want to show you some images. But uh, I think uh, everybody here uh, knows that we have uh, a pretty serious thing, uh, not just pretty serious, but a serious uh, problem with our food system, not only in this country but around the world. Uh, I'm fortunate to be able to travel in... Uh, see a lot of cities and a lot of places around the world where uh, people are really suffering uh, with bad food, and I'm sure uh, because of lack of access and many other problems that our uh, 
you know, for many, uh, you know, I hate to play, place the blame. We're always placing blame on the industrial food system, but we're, we've been a part of that because we purchased that food. Uh, but we, need, we realize that uh, we need to change that system because we have so, much, so many problems from uh, folks being very, uh, getting very sick from food uh, to um, our youth eating some of the worst food when they go to school uh, in our school system, to uh, environmental impact that uh, our agricultural systems had uh, that has changed a, a lot of things in this country, especially uh, things like uh, fish and that we eat. Uh, a lot of people like to eat fish today because for all the benefits that fish can bring you, but we have a serious problem with our uh, fish industry and in that over 50%, soon to be 75% in the next five years, of uh, fish that we eat will be raised on farms rather than our ocean streams and lakes and so forth. So uh, uh, we can talk about all of these uh, uh, terrible problems we have with the food system because our food is something that um, should uh, be good medicine for us. And, and every day we, t we take uh, medicine three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some of us uh, eat good medicine and some of us eat really bad medicine. And uh, we have to fix that. When you think about the uh, three pillars of uh, uh, our health, uh, nutrition uh, being one and uh, exercise and the other stress management, about, for me, about two thirds of that is uh, on the nutritional side in terms of what we eat, what we put into our system. Uh, if we could solve that piece, uh, we would be two-thirds of the way there uh, to really living much better lives, and we could see a lot of the, uh, the disease and problems that we have in our society uh, go away. So the work that I've done, uh, really from birth, because a lot of people ask me, well, when did you get into this? Well, I was kind of born into uh, growing, growing food because of the long history my family have, a legacy of growing uh, healthy food for folks. But... Uh, the food system uh, that I work on today is, is kind of new in terms of how we do it, in terms of the fact that as we sit here right now, we're losing uh, farmland, either to industrial agriculture or to development or whatever, uh, and we're still losing our rural farmers that were the backbone of building our food system for so many years. But there's a new farmer in town, and this farmer that we have um, coming into town doesn't come from traditional farm families. Uh, this new farmer that we have uh, doesn't have a lot of baggage. Uh, this new farmer wants to learn these concepts uh, of farming uh, more intensively, but not intensive agriculture you think of in terms of the industrial system, but intensive agriculture and how to use space that we have inside our cities or even being more innovative in terms of vertical farms, and we'll build the first vertical farm in the world. Uh, we'll break ground this year for a five-story uh, vertical farm in Milwaukee. Uh, because some places like New York or San Francisco, Vancouver, Tokyo, those cities, they don't have a large land mass. So we're gonna have to go up in the air, but first we have to quantify this stuff. Because uh, there are a lot of renderings out there for 50, 100 story buildings, but nobody's ever built one and, uh, and we haven't quantified. So we need to grow, uh, build something that we can really quantify uh, how is this going to work? Can we cash flow uh, that type of farm if we start building these skyscrapers? How do we use uh, vacant buildings to grow? And how do we grow food on asphalt? Because we have a lot of vacant asphalt in our cities. How do we grow on that? How do we grow on concrete on rooftops so it's safe to be able to grow on rooftops? Uh, so there's uh, so much innovation. The good news is that this new farmer I'm talking about is much younger than me. As a matter of fact, 60% of the folks that are now in uh, the food system are under 40 years of age. So that's the good news. And as I look around at this crowd, you can see, uh, I can see that. As I travel the country, I was in, at Duke University last week, same thing. 500 people, I would say 60% were under uh, 40 years of age that are interested in food systems and growing food and want to getting into the industry and the hundreds of jobs that I think will be created, hundreds of different categories of jobs, thousands of different jobs 
that we'll be able to create. We need folks to do renewable energy. We need, uh, we need finance people. We need architects and planners. Every aspect of our society is involved in the food system. As a matter of fact, we recently uh, had a, a meeting, uh, met with the chancellor at UW-Milwaukee, and presented him with an idea of uh, doing an urban uh, uh, nutrition and agricultural institute in Milwaukee at our place. Well, actually, next door at the Army Reserve base that's being decommissioned over 400 acres of land to build a, a building that uh, we would share and co-direct with the university. And every university in the state would be involved, and we're going to start out with master and, doc and doctoral students. So, um, you know, this, this movement is really growing. And, and, and it's important that we have everybody at the table, because I remember a time when uh, this movement was really run by academics and crusty old farmers like me. Uh, but now we have so many different uh, folks that want to be a part of it. But we have to quantify a lot of things. We have to prove that this works for these young people who want careers uh, when they graduate college or they come out of programs in the, in the inner cities or uh, even rural uh, young people that want to farm, but they've seen their parents suffer from growing the conventional way. And the other piece that we have to get fixed is we need more funding to be transferred from uh, the conventional farming uh, subsidies uh, into sustainable agriculture, because there's not a lot of money to really uh, do farmer training. And that's one of the things that we have to get trained to do these intensive uh, kind of methods of being able to grow food a different kind of way, to grow it intensively, to use of space, to think of agriculture instead of acres or hectares in terms of square footage. How much can we grow in a square foot? And what will that take to be able to grow a natural or organic product in every square foot that we have? So that's what I want to uh, show you a little bit of the history of <clears throat> how we are doing that. Uh, currently, um, we produce, uh, if you remember, I, I, you're going to see a lot of slides. I want you to remember one thing, that when it, when it comes to the food, it's, about, it's all about the soil. And any farmer will tell you, any critical gardener will tell you, if you're going to grow uh, without chemicals, it's all about the soil. So try to remember that. And that's what we do, is we grow soil. If you can grow soil, you can grow healthy food. So this year, we'll compost 22 million pounds of residue, food residue, and carbon uh, materials into compost. So we do it every day. We collect waste every day. We compost every day. Because we don't just need a few hundred yards of, of compost. We need hundreds of thousands of yards of compost. And that's doable because of all the waste that we uh, dump in the landfill every day. If we can convert that into high uh, fertility soil and be able to grow worm castings, we produce over 100,000 pounds of worm castings every four months as fertilizer. To be able to do that, we need that kind of, we need that in every city, or twice that, or three times that amount, to really fundamentally change the food system because our soil is contaminated. And we shouldn't be growing in the existing soil. And I still uh, see people going out and buying rototillers and tractors and trying to plow up hard pan clay, and all you're doing is stirring up. Uh, uh, things like lead and arsenic and all the bad guys in the soil. And, and then we plant food, and uh, a lot of that food uh, takes up the contaminants, and we eat that food because we don't know that much about our food. So we really have to educate ourselves about our food. When we go in the grocery store, we have no idea how long that food's been sitting on that shelf, even those, those misters that you see and those lights that shine on that food. Sometimes that food is seven 10 days old, and we take it home, and we stick it in our refrigerator for a couple days, and now it's 12 days old, and then we eat it. And basically, you're eating a lot of cellulose, regardless of how much you pay for it. So we really need to understand our food, and a local food system is the only way that you can guarantee that you're eating food that has its full nutrient impact. 
and we need to be able to test our food more so we know and we feel confident that we're not going to get sick when we go to a restaurant or uh, eat somewhere because we know uh, we were at a restaurant last night and uh, this restaurant gave us so much information of where the food came from. Uh, the taste of the food was so fresh, we just knew it because the restaurant tours were uh, so knowledgeable and they weren't afraid to pass on that knowledge to their customers and they have a thriving business. So that's what we need to do. So I'm gonna uh, go ahead and get started. On our 45-hour uh, tour. Uh, these were the early years. I purchased the last remaining uh, greenhouse uh, and farm in the city of Milwaukee in 1993. And that's what it looks like, too. Uh, the east there is the Army Reserve Base, some 400 acres of land. And we did a few row crops, and, uh, you know, the place was a complete disaster. Uh, these were the young people that are over 30 years of age. And they're different than the young people today because there's something very different about them. Uh, one of the things that's different about these young people, they have their pants pulled up. <laughs> um, you can see how close our neighbors, we started doing uh, small scale composting way back then on the site in the city and the kids would come uh, uh, out uh, from the neighbor's neighborhood. And we used that back 40 to grow food with the kids and you can see the the A-frame greenhouse, uh, we took out all the glass. It was kind of a mess. We reconstructed it. We scaled up our compost. Um, we started doing a lot more compost there, as you can see. And you'll see the transformation. We started out with these worm boxes. Uh, started with 30 pounds of worms. Today we have 7,000 pounds of worms on our farms. And these, uh, again, these young people are about 30 years old. We started an aquaponics uh, project. And, uh, these three barrel configurations. One was a weed tank, one was a fish tank, and, and uh, one was a filter tank. And uh, we put an air stone down one of the pipes and it moved water from, uh, from tank to tank and it created a sustainable uh, system that we could raise about 50 tilapia in about six months to a year, to a pound and a half. So this was kind of a, a youth project, but also a project that you could use uh, at people's homes, especially, uh, this was a heifer project that could be used in Africa and some of the countries to grow protein. So remember that image, because you're gonna see that, how I was able to engineer that into what we have today. Uh, we also grew a lot of bedding plants back in those days, and we used those bedding plants to decorate around the city of Milwaukee with our youth, as we had started as a youth-serving organization uh, back in those days, and I would teach the kids and one of the things that I found that many of these young people uh, had really poor reading and writing skills. So after they did something physical, hands-on, we'd bring them in and they'd have to write about it. It really improved their grades. They wanted to dig deeper. We'd give them some stuff to read. And, and that's something that many of the schools in Milwaukee and around the state of Wisconsin are doing today, this idea of hands-on learning that leads to uh, academic excellence. And also some of the living skills like uh, Canning, we would teach the kids how to can and how to use tools. Some of us in the crowd today don't know how to properly use tools. That's a life skill that we can all use. I also worked with the juvenile justice system. Some of these kids had gone out and did some really bad stuff. They were coming back from four and five years of incarceration and we put them through this transitional program and I'd bring compost, put it on the hillsides of their facility and they would grow food and. Uh, they would donate that, so it was uh, a therapy of giving something back. They had taken so much from society, and now they were able to give, give back. And then we would work on projects like this one here at Neighborhood House, where there were car thefts, and we removed the shrubs so that uh, the staff could see to the street, and we put flowers, we brought in compost, and uh, the, the kids in that program that we worked with uh, had grown those bedding plants, and they would plant them in the island between the street and the sidewalk, and it would help beautify the community, uh, and it really changed and softened uh, the community, and people really uh, liked that, and the thefts went away, because people started paying attention. They were looking at the flowers, and I guess the car thieves thought they were looking at them uh, as they passed by. Uh, we would do the same thing on vacant lots. We'd take a vacant lot, I'd bring in 75 
of yards of compost and energize the community. And one day we would transform that uh, corner lot where drug dealers would be hanging out and people would just go right by and not even look their way. And all of a sudden we would uh, plant these bedding plants that the kids uh, did in the greenhouse. And I call these flower explosions. And, and this is how it looked after we were finished. And the kids had summer jobs taking care of those flowers and watering them. And it totally changed uh, that vacant lot and many other vacant lots that we did that program uh, where drug dealers went away because people started turning and looking at the flowers and I guess they thought they were looking at them. Uh, then we had uh, organizations from native reservations out west that would come uh, from South Dakota uh, and uh, because they were suffering from high rates of diabetes, almost 50% some of those uh, native reservations. And then there was a community in Chicago, Inglewood, where there was a murder a day. So we would put up uh, hoop houses and start growing food and get the youth involved in a healthier activity. In 1995, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, our major newspaper, wrote a front page story about me working with these kids and kind of launched us into the turn of the century there. And uh, this is what growing power looks like today. Um, you see tr quite a trans, uh, uh, a transition from what it was to uh, what it is today. We're powered by a lot of solar, uh, a lot of renewable energy from solar anaerobic digestion. Uh, we use uh, compost to heat many of our structures. And we're uh, located in a densely populated community where the closest grocery store is three and a half miles away. So it's truly a food desert. Uh, where the only healthy food is at our small retail store. <clears throat> uh, we call this a community food center. And a community food center, by our definition, is a place where people can learn to grow food, process, market, distribute. It's a meeting place for folks uh, where thousands of people come uh, now from all over the world uh, to meet and get trained as we train over 1,000 farmers a year at this facility. Uh, we're one of the only multicultural, multi-generational organizations in the country of our size uh, that's led by a person of color. Um, so uh, we really, I really believe in multiculturalism. Having grown up uh, in Bethesda, Rockville border, I was always involved in uh, more of a multicultural kind of uh, 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 growing up. So uh, these are the faces of the people that visit Growing Power uh, throughout the year. Uh, our training starts in January. Uh, uh, through June, our major trainings that we do are weekend trainings, and these are the folks that show up and some of our staff. Uh, so it's people from all communities uh, from around the world as we train folks from Africa and Asia and Eastern Europe and so forth. So uh, people want to learn how to grow food uh, sustainably. They want to learn how to grow, grow food without fossil fuels, and uh, we've solved some of those um, problems and you'll see as we move forward. So a sustainable food system is a, a system that really, even these guys <laughs> come to Growing Power uh, several years ago. And uh, when I talk about these corporate companies like uh, Chase uh, and uh, Walmart and Wells Fargo Bank and Rockwell Automation and Coles Corporation, uh, 10 years ago, we wouldn't want those people at the table, but for us to solve this problem, we need everybody at the table, what I call the good food revolution table. Uh, we need those folks um, at the table. We can no longer uh, be so idealistic and uh, not have them at the table because they're all part of our society and we need to educate them as well as our politicos and, and uh, uh, different folk, corporate companies and so forth. Notice that didn't include universities. Uh, because the universities are doing a great job today. It's all about locally grown food. That we celebrate food, and if you come to Growing Power, and those of you who've come there, you know that you're going to eat good. Uh, we serve all the meals for our trainings. If you're there for three days, and it's all local food. Um, and uh, again, getting back to uh, soil, everybody knows this, this guy rumbles through your neighborhood every day. Or, uh oh. I need some. 
I did something wrong here. Uh, do we have a technical proof? We're right, right here. Back there. Right here? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Show us my technical skills are. Thank you. Okay. Everybody knows this guy. Uh, they want us to think, anybody, I hope nobody works for this company. <laughs> uh, they want us to think that they think green. They say they have over 17,000 acres of wildlife habitat uh, around the Milwaukee market place uh, and of course this truck uh, but the only thing that I I've been to those landfills the only thing I see is uh, seagulls and really big rats so I don't know what they're talking about mm -hmm. um, and um, these trucks uh, run on electricity but it's really all about the soil if we're able to divert uh, that waste from the landfill uh, but to do that, you have to develop relationships with the folks that have waste, from breweries in Milwaukee, where we get from just one brewery 80,000 pounds a week. Uh, we get uh, waste from Miller Brewery. Um, we're going to be getting over 100,000 uh, several times a week. Uh, wood chip from four municipalities, thousands of yards of wood chip uh, from my Farmer friends that have moldy hay is part of our, and of course, many fruits and vegetables that get shipped in never get uh, to the accounts. They come in the frozen loads or they over order. So all of that material uh, goes into our recipe to make compost. Because to make good compost, you need uh, pretty much equal parts of carbon and nitrogen uh, to do that. And uh, we do over a million pounds just at our facility in Milwaukee where we're 200 feet away from our neighbors. And then the finished product goes out to communities. And we use this compost, uh, we teach people how to, how to do it in a 4x4 four four configuration. It takes about 40 wheelbarrow loads of compost, of uh, materials to make compost. 40 wheelbarrows will fit into that 4x4 four four configuration. So that gives you a perspective of how much waste you have to collect to make one yard of compost. So, it, uh, and that's surprising to a lot of folks that come to our training. And we want to maximize it, so we get somebody up there with good legs and uh, pound it down to make sure we can get every bit of uh, material into that uh, <laughs> system. And of course, people are fascinated by worms, you know. We have, uh, again, 7,000 pounds of worms. We started with 30 pounds of worms. Um, and uh, this particular uh, bin situation is good for uh, smaller scale uh, uh, urban uh, gardens and so forth. And it passes uh, most cities' uh, problem with composting because you're, you're not dealing with the rodent situations and so forth. And then you have this wonderful finished product, the best soil in the world, because that's what you need. We have to grow, we have to put what we've taken from Mother Earth back into, uh, back into the earth. And that's what it looks like. And if you want to scale it up, you have to find bigger sites. One of our sites is our rural farm, where we do hundreds and thousands of yards in windrows using some equipment. So when I say it's all about the soil, and once you have that soil, you can do something like this. This is called vermi vermiculture. These are the worms. Again, we have seven different varieties of worms. Some of them live over 20 years. So our worms are our livestock. We have. Uh, Billions of worms. And so there are other employees. And I really like those employees because they never talk back. They just, you feed them and they go to work and um, they're just great to work with. So those of you who've done uh, vermicomposting know what I mean. So we built these uh, systems in our greenhouse, over 40,000 pounds in this one greenhouse. We have some systems that are 280-yard uh, vermicomposting systems, 150 
backyard uh, systems, and every uh, four months, these worms uh, uh, create four times as many worms. So the reproduction rates are off the chart. And it's a numbers game. The more you have, the faster they break that compost down. And that's what a cocoon looks like. Over 20 worms will come out of that cocoon. And it's a great transformative moment to put 200 worms in a child's hands. Uh, it really changes their, uh, the way they look at things in life, you know. Even the adults, look at this guy. <laughs> He's really into it, you know. I don't know what she found in the worm bin. But. And then we uh, recover our livestock. We use a screening method. The worms actually uh, pass through a screen. Uh, we put uh, compost, uh, put the screen down. This is common window screen. So uh, if you're gonna get into this business, all you have to do to save costs, go home, cut off your window screens, and you'll be able to do this. Uh, but that's the most passive way of getting the worms out. They actually crawl through the screen once you put fresh compost on top of the screen. And then you have this wonderful uh, worm castings that we market for $2 a pound uh, wholesale to critical growers and farmers and $4 a, a pound to a retail. So that will help you cash flow your uh, operation. We have, uh, at Growing Power, we have over 40 income streams. Uh, over 50% of our income we create ourselves. So uh, until last year, uh, we didn't have a full-time grant writer. Uh, and we have a pretty large budget. So um, you can do this in a, as a nonprofit or as a for-profit. But eight months ago, <clears throat> That was food waste and carbon waste, and now it's the highest quality organic fertilizer that you can turn into compost tea and spray it on your plants. It's probably the most effective way of using this material. And then we have uh, depositories. Again, <clears throat> they said it couldn't be done, that you cannot raise worms outside in our harsh temperatures, but we keep those piles at 70 to 90 degrees during the winter and the worms don't know whether they're indoors or outdoors as long as they're in that 70 to 90 degree range. <clears throat> and once we have, remember that three barrel configuration uh, that we had, now we have these 10,000 gallon systems in our greenhouses using vertical space, using space that you typically don't use in greenhouses below ground to be able to raise 10,000 fish. This system right here, uh, we have 10,000 tilapia. Uh, we start getting income from the plants because this is called aquaponics. There's a symbiotic relationship between uh, the fish and the plants. The fish give off ammonia that transfers to nitrate to nitrite. We have to pull that out of the water. The plants pull that out of the water with fast growing plants like watercress that we market for $16 a pound to, to restaurants. And then at the end of uh, a year, you have $50,000 of fish that you can market. Uh, this particular system uh, has uh, 20,000 gallons of water, uh, recirculating closed system, uh, water conservation system. You only add makeup water. There is no uh, external source of water coming into this system. Uh, the system on the right is heated, uh, and this greenhouse is heated by water. Having a thermal mass of hot water is the most effective way of heating a greenhouse that saves 50% of the fossil fuel use of heating greenhouses if you're able to have that thermal mass of hot water. And now we have solar. 70% of our water is heated by solar now. In every uh, greenhouse, we have these systems of growing fish. Here's our staff putting in uh, some of the 10,000 lake perch that are mercury contaminated in Lake Michigan. It's the, favorite fish of Midwesterners. If we had two million pounds today, we'd have it sold, of fillets, we'd have it sold by tonight. Tremendous opportunity, uh, and I know uh, they're doing uh, some uh, research at the center on uh, aquaponics. So that's very exciting uh, for this university to have uh, the center working on projects like that. 
to quantify and to show the community and work with the community to uh, show them how these are lake perch. And that's what they look like, delicious. Those are tilapia, lake perch, tilapia. That's paku. That's a South American fish that gets up to 60 pounds. Uh, we recently harvested about five of them for our commercial urban ag folks that come in uh, every month from around the country. And uh, the most delicious fish I've ever tried. They are vegetarians. They are in the Amazon, in Brazil. They're Brazilian fish uh, that most chefs know about and they would love. Every chef I've talked to just can't wait to get their hands on one of these. Uh, they're delicious. Um, uh, you, you can make it a number of different ways. You can barbecue it, you can bake it. You can bake the whole fish. It has a tremendous amount of meat on it. It has a big center bone in it. Doesn't have a lot of small bones. Uh, it's uh, related to piranha. So if you want to Google that, Paku, uh, Black Paku, that's what they're called. And we do some uh, koi as well. We're also uh, raising some of our own, uh, uh, speaking of sustainability, we can't continue to use fossil fuels to uh, grow our feed for our livestock. So one of the things we're doing is this is a black soldier fly, which is a wasp-like creature uh, that uh, lays a larvae that uh, breaks down food waste. If you have uh, food waste, you'll find these in the summertime. They only activate in warm weather, but they eat the heck out of uh, food waste. This barrel had 200,000 of them. They're 42% protein. So we've developed systems to grow these out uh, 50 pounds a day at 42% protein as a, a protein supplement. Now this is, uh, this is that back 40 uh, that you saw earlier. And you can see what we do. We bank compost, we call this hot mix, 150 degree temperature on the exterior walls. In the four corners of each one of these uh, uh, hoop houses, we put compost emitting 150 degrees out of the four corners. That way we can grow food. In Wisconsin, we get sometimes 30 below zero wind chills. Um, but to be able to do this, and of course in Maryland, you could do this much easier because you don't have those harsh temperatures. And we grow on all new soil, 24 inches, 36 inch wide beds. That's our uh, protocol for building out these farms. And you're able to grow throughout about 40 different, uh, uh, 40 different types of greens during the wintertime. And of course, kale is one of the most important, very intensive production because you have so much energy in the soil because of the compost and the vermicompost and the worms because we, there are worms in every pot. We have 25,000 pots in our greenhouses at our national headquarters. Every pot has worms, and those worms are producing energy. So you have this sustainable uh, biological system that you grow in, and you can grow this intensive. And that's where it's at. To be able to grow at $5 a square foot, up to $50 a square foot for our sprouts. At $5 a square foot, uh, that's 44,000 something square feet in an acre. We're talking $200,000 an acre of production. Gross. That's where we need to be in the future. At $50 a square foot for sprouts that grow in one week, we're over a million dollars an acre. That's where we need to be. And we've been able to get this product into our public schools in Milwaukee uh, through Cisco, who is the only delivery system into the public school systems in southeast Wisconsin. So this is how we grow. When it gets 25 degrees below zero, uh, or lower, we cover those beds with plastic. We use nine gauge wire over the beds and we cover it, but we're able to grow this throughout the year. So we're not just growing food uh, in the summertime and, and 20 weeks, we're growing 365 days of the year because once you get a customer, if we're gonna be, this is a very competitive arena that we're stepping into because wholesalers own it. So for us to compete, we have to be able to do what they can do only better by producing a product uh, and then starting with uh, these young farmers like my grandson here uh, who wants to be a farmer. And uh, uh, this is my photographer's son who uh, is in a Zen moment who's trying to figure out whether he wants to uh, be in the food system. So uh, 
But we cover those beds, and then you can produce uh, crops like this. This kale, of course, is one of the top five uh, most nutritious foods. We should be eating lots of kale. It tastes great in the wintertime. It gets touched with frost, and it sweetens it up and tenderizes it. Uh, intensive field production, why not? It's all about the soil. If we can get our uh, farms on the edge, uh, the soil right, we can grow. Excuse me. We can grow like this. This is a 30-acre farm in Merton, Wisconsin, which is right outside of Milwaukee. Intensive uh, production there this past summer. That's intensive field production, using every square foot to grow things like parsley here, salad mix, bull's blood beets, amaranth. Mustard greens, turnip greens, red mustard. We can do this if we are able to get our soil right. 100,000 pounds of carrots went into the Milwaukee Public Schools. This coming year, uh, we just had a meeting uh, with the MPS and Cisco and our processor. We're going to uh, grow 250,000 pounds of carrots, and that's what they use in an annual school year. So the opportunities are there, but it's all about the soil. We have to get our soil back to where it was pre-1950. And 19, our soil today is 50% less fertile than it was in 1950. So that's where we are. Intensive greenhouse production, using vertical space inside our A-frame greenhouse is not growing on one plane like many operators do who think they have tons of space and uh, they don't have the, they haven't experimented and tried it, but growing on seven different levels, taking, say, 3,000 square feet of production and turning it into 5,000 square feet of production, that's what we need to do. To be able to grow multiple crops, integrated uh, food system uh, that we have here, to be able to stuff Every kind of crop from mushrooms, uh, shiitake mushrooms that we dip in water to enhance the blooming, to dip into our fish systems, to uh, uh, growing in pots like this, 25,000 to grow salad, all different types of salad, to these sprouts uh, that are $50 a square foot. This is where we have to go. Mushrooms that sell for $16 a pound, these oyster mushrooms. $16 a pound, three weeks from spawn, using natural materials like straw, stuffed in feed bags. They grow these, and they're delicious, and restaurants want them. Shiitake mushrooms, again. Stacking plants on top of each other. As long as they're able to get enough light, uh, they do quite well throughout the winter. And then we teach people that come to Growing Power how to harvest. We take them through the whole piece of how to, how to fill trays uh, with material, which is worm castings. We grow all our sprouts and worm castings in koi or coconut fiber, which is a sustainable product, instead of using peat moss, uh, which is, becomes an environmental disaster when we dig out all the bogs uh, in Canada and other places around the world. To be able to take a farm a piece of land and convert it into a farm in six weeks. This farm was built out in six weeks of 90, 20 by 96 foot uh, hoop houses. This is uh, in the summertime. We use shade cloth on some of them. Uh, we're able to grow greens throughout the summertime. When I hear people say you can't grow greens in the summertime, that's not true. You can do it. And that's part of it. And these young men didn't even know how to hold a hammer a year ago. They're the ones that built that system. They're out building today. We have a crew of about 18 now. And we have a harvesting team of, of 13 people that go out and harvest these crops. So we have to fill these uh, hoop houses with new soil, like this. We start filling them before we even get the covers on. Because as soon as the covers get on those, I seed them. We can do this anywhere. We can do it on asphalt, concrete, it doesn't matter. 
but you have to have the soil. We have to grow the soil and we have the material to be able to do that. Anything grows in those high tunnels. You have less bug pressure. You have protection from the rain. You have protection from wind. The cost is about $3,500 per house. You can cash flow that in one season. You can grow tomatoes without disease because we have all these blight conditions. You can grow okra, extend the season on okra <coughs> because outside our okra season is only a month. We're able to grow four months of okra, which is probably my favorite food. Carrots, peppers, and then things like uh, wheatgrass, which uh, we supply more wheatgrass than anybody else in the state of Wisconsin. We grow wheatgrass, uh, hundreds of trays of wheatgrass that go out for juicing. And we know, and this is what the product looks like. The preferred salad mix, about 12 different uh, salad greens in our salad mix. Uh, we grow nasturtiums year-round. Uh, all of these uh, different greens, baby greens, that go out to our restaurants. And uh, we have a, a marketing system that we're able to get this food to everybody in our community. Not just high-end restaurants, but into our market basket. We have a, a year-round CSA program. So we're able to get bags of food for $16 to our customers throughout the city. We're able to drop food. We have over 15 different uh, uh, farm stands. We go to farmer's markets, but our thing is farm stands because we can set those up in any community that, has, that needs food. And then we need more energy. This is an anaerobic digester. Uh, I have a partner. We developed this system to take solid food waste into a slurry and then we suck it into the, this tank and it's heated to 100 degrees to activate the bacteria uh, to produce acetic acid, which is a high form of vinegar that can be stored for over a year and turned it in, uh, changing the bacterial structure and turning it, uh, putting it in a methane digester and producing methane to run a generator. So we're gonna build uh, this out. That's Mark Heffernan, my partner in this project. So we take food waste and grind it into the slurry like this before it's sucked into the tank. That's going on the exterior of the tank and it gets sucked into the tank. Looks like uh, uh, tomato soup, almost good enough to eat. Or pea soup. Solar energy, we need more energy. So we have a construction team uh, at our organization. Now we have over 100 employees. We're gonna be hiring another 150 this year. Uh, we build these systems now, uh, these pergolas, uh, working with our, uh, our uh, local utility. We get 22 cents a kilowatt hour through this program. We pay about 10.8, so it's an opportunity. Solar hot water, we supply 70% of the hot water in our system by this innovative solar system, uh, working with a European company uh, we put these six by sixes six feet in the ground below the frost line and mounted these very delicate panels that can withstand 100 mile an hour winds the way they're engineered. Uh, and this supplies us, these panels get up to over 200, or actually get up uh, uh, over 300 degrees. Uh, and then uh, the glycol travels, if it's over 300 degrees, we have to uh, dump some of the heat before it goes into the heat exchanger, the heat's uh, the water for our fish systems and so forth. We also capture all of the water off of all of the buildings. That be, that's gonna become uh, critically important in the future of where we source our water from. Uh, lots of water used in industrial agriculture. We have to do it a different way. We can't just suck water from our rivers and streams. We have to capture water, store water, and reuse it. So we're able to capture that water uh, from our gutter systems, and these systems double as fish systems. I only got five minutes? Or is that 50 minutes? Oh, five minutes, okay. All right, I gotta really travel. See, see you guys didn't believe I had uh, nearly a thousand slides. Okay, we're gonna really move now, because uh, we're short on time. We also have animals at Growing Power, over 50 goats. 
Uh, we make artisan cheese uh, from these goats. Uh, we milk them, and you can see the neighbors love them because they can look out their backyard and see animals. And we have over 500 layers. Uh, we feed them food waste, so they're like out on the range. I also have a, a breeding system for uh, heirloom turkeys. And uh, these two uh, fellows kind of look like uh, some folks I know. So they, uh, uh, and bees. Uh, we teach beekeeping, urban beekeeping. Uh, there's more bee production. We get over 100 uh, pounds of honey per hive. Uh, this year, we're adding another 50 hives. Uh, we can't keep enough honey. This honey um, sells very quickly. We call it urban honey. Um, and I like this shot. This is downtown Chicago. We have five farms in Chicago. One of, some of our projects, growing power projects, I uh, like to work with folks with uh, uh, disabilities, but they're not handicapped. This blind young lady was able to seed, uh, harvest sprouts. I was able to teach her how to do it in a half hour. Ch Catholic Charities, taking this seniors, immigrant seniors that were playing cards, but they didn't want to play cards, they wanted to farm. So we were able to come in, put down wood chip, build beds, and now these seniors have a garden on top of asphalt and concrete. Coles Corporation, one of the major corporations and one of our big supporters and funders, uh, we put gardens on their corporate campus, bringing in compost that they daycare center, these young preschoolers, uh, the mayor wanted to be like the White House, so what we did is we brought in uh, about 50,000 pounds of compost downtown Milwaukee, and now the mayor has this wonderful uh, garden at City Hall for the last uh, three years. Rockwell Automation, another company that wanted a farm stand, 2,000 employees to uh, improve the health of their employees. Discovery World, we have an aquaponics system there to show thousands of people. Forest Home Cemetery, somebody mentioned a cemetery earlier. Uh, we're growing at a cemetery greenhouse. We reconstructed, uh, it had a lot of damage. Now we're keeping people out of that upper left-hand quadrant a little bit longer if they eat that healthy food. <laughs> so we're looking for spaces, wherever you can find spaces to grow food uh, in a city and the most unusual places. Jackson, working with Cisco, we have a, uh, a cooperative uh, agreement with Cisco. They take our product. This is a 34-acre farm where we grew over 100,000 pounds of carrots. Those are the carrots there, and we grew thousands of peppers and tomatoes. King Drive, we're building out a new store. It'll be uh, one of the first stores of its kind in the nation, uh, organic uh, food and uh, deli uh, in an area that has no food. New Berlin, Wisconsin, right on the edge of the city, another farm, working with the mayor, and uh, Lowe's Corporation, we put in 40 gardens, but we, having the compost, we're able to do that. This is our new composting site that several people today wanted to see. This is at the sewage treatment plant. Uh, three large lagoons that hadn't been used for, for uh, 20 years. I was able to negotiate uh, a deal with uh, our Metropolitan Sewage District because they have problems at the deep tunnel and they want to wanted uh, some good publicity, I guess, and now we have this wonderful composting site in a place where it stinks already and our compost actually sweetens the area up a little bit. <laughs> so this is where uh, we're doing that 22 million pounds. We do it every day. We compost every day, regardless of whether it's 30 below zero, uh, that waste has to be uh, moved. And that's brewery waste, wood chip, cardboard, all of that came from Mother Earth and we're putting it back. Menominee Valley, where there's lots of land, uh, over 60 acres of land in Milwaukee. This is a, a building that I bought uh, recently. It's gonna be an aquaculture center. This is an old laundry facility that we'll be able to uh, uh, convert into a uh, uh, fish hatchery because that's what we need. But we started building out hoop houses on top of asphalt. These young men that I showed you earlier, this is what they do. And they have good paying jobs, these young people, in the training program, uh, working with a, a vocational school. The first green garage, totally off the grid. The family has, um, all the materials were uh, renewable materials. Uh, this family now has a year-round growing situation. Badger. Uh, Rock School, a new school, we ex 
excavated the, the old school, that's the old school, the new school is just about to be completed, working with the Center for Resilient Cities, uh, other partner. Uh, this is an agricultural school with agricultural curriculum uh, that we have developed. Maple Tree School, tw five acres in a uh, food desert area, over six miles of uh, no food in this area. Uh, brought in compost, signed a 20-year lease with Milwaukee Public School System to operate this farm. I know we're getting close. We're almost there, Mia. Uh, working with the youth. They learn how to do things and uh, outreach projects around the country, working with uh, farmers in the South to help them, whether it's fish farmers, to help them, the Blackfeet Nation, another project, because they're worried about extinction. They lose three people a week out of 8,000 in Browning, Montana, working after Katrina to put up uh, hoop houses, uh, doing strategic planning in the South, working with the Young People's Project in Jackson, uh, Mississippi. These young people, a math literacy program, uh, they, these kids realized they needed healthy food. Community Action or Organization in Buffalo, New York, where there's lots of vacant land, uh, putting up 50 uh, hoop houses and aquaponics systems. Growing Power Chicago, the mo probably the most aesthetic urban farm in the nation on the front doorstep of Chicago. 150 different uh, varieties of uh, vegetables and edible flowers and herbs. Uh, it's called Art on the Farm, a French protege design of a farm. I hauled 100,000 pounds, Cabrini Green on top of asphalt. This is a peace garden with gentrification coming from the east. Uh, the Fourth Presbyterian Church hired us seven years ago uh, to build this farm. We've been operating this farm uh, for over seven years and have a youth program, a farm stand uh, for folks. Iron Street, this is our latest new farm in Chicago, uh, taking an old uh, uh, trucking firm and converting it into a farm. Jackson Park uh, in Chicago, one acre farm uh, funded by Nature's Path, the organization out of uh, uh, Vancouver who's putting in 39 gardens. Gallery 37 in downtown Chicago was our first project. Schools in Chicago, bringing in compost on top of asphalt, senior gardens. Uh, we were at the Chicago Flower and Garden Show in 2010, 2011. This was our display there to show what urban agriculture needs to be aesthetically pleasing. And that's what it's all about. And training these youth corps members, they get paid, these young people, and uh, keeps them busy. And they stay in our program from eight years old all the way through college, and our market basket program, an international outreach in Kenya. Uh, that's a, uh, a rudimentary fence around a landfill in Kenya. They have fertil soil, fertility, uh, soil, soil fertility problems as well uh, in places like Kenya and Uganda and, and South Africa and Zimbabwe where we're doing some work. Ukraine, now that the Russians are gone, uh, it used to be a breadbasket, uh, central London, there are gardens behind uh, walls in central London. So this is happening all over the globe where urban agriculture is starting to uh, flourish. Our regional training centers, 15, this was in Georgia, Fort Valley State, Georgia, Mississippi, at the oldest black uh, uh, township in America that was started after the Civil War. Uh, they're back wanting to grow food in a rich agricultural area that had been decimated by industrial agriculture, growing corn, soybeans, milo, and uh, crops like this. Seven acres of land in 4C, Arkansas, turning, breaking new grounds, and Louisville, Kentucky, another one of our regional training centers. Now they're growing food, putting up hoop houses. Lynchburg, Virginia, old seven-acre greenhouse uh, that used to grow roses. Now they're growing food and doing composting, and they're selling compost now and uh, improving the lives. Minnesota uh, Women's Environmental Institute working with uh, Little Earth of Nations. D-Town, Detroit, where there's 169 uh, square miles of land, half of it's unoccupied. This organization we work with, uh, the Black uh, Food Security Network, is now building hoop houses and starting to grow food on a seven acre. The Stiletto Gardens, why not in a backyard? This young lady wanted a garden in her backyard, so now she's one of our regional centers um, uh, showing that you can do it in your backyard. You can compost with neighbors around. Riddle and the Forgotten uh, Triangle in a 26 acre uh, ag reserve now where <coughs> folks are growing food. Riddle 
Blair Grocery in the Ninth Ward in uh, New Orleans. Bed-Stuy, we built out this farm this year. Uh, two reverends, a husband and wife reverend team, are putting healthy food into their bags at their, at their pantry. They wanted to grow food. They got two vacant lots. University of District of Columbia, I have a year contract. We built, uh, excavated a one acre composting site that will start in April to grow uh, soil for the District of Columbia. The future, this is our five story vertical farm, the first of its kind in the world that will be, will be breaking ground uh, for this and really quantifying growing food on uh, multiple levels, greenhouses on multiple levels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now you uh, can appreciate how excited we were when we were able to uh, uh, persuade Will to include Baltimore on his uh, global itinerary. And uh, we hope that we as a community at the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University, our partners in the community, can rise to the occasion and that one of Will's future 300 slideshow presentations will have a couple of shots of Baltimore. Uh, Last but not least, Will uh, co-authored with uh, Eric Schlosser the uh, afterword of this uh, very powerful little book. Plenty of copies up here for those of you who want to uh, purchase a copy and have Will uh, sign it. On the Future of Food, it captures the speech that uh, Prince Charles, uh, uh, the uh, Prince of Wales gave last uh, May in Washington, D.C. at a uh, food summit uh, that Will was part of. And uh, the summary of the challenges that you've heard described in such uh, powerful ways by Will today uh, are included in uh, Prince Charles' speech and then the afterward by uh, Will and Eric Slosher is really very uh, compelling. So I encourage all of you who want a really uh, terrific uh, condensed version of what uh, we all need to do in order to secure <clears throat> our food system for the future. Uh, I think we're gonna have to stop here. I know the students have 130 classes. Those of you who do wanna ask uh, Will some questions, he'll be up uh, here at the front desk. And again, uh, thank you so much for being with us.